everyone. Um, it's good to see you all. Uh, welcome for all of those of you who are beaming in or uh, joining us from all over the country and our days, our, I dare say from uh, other countries. Uh, greetings from San Francisco. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Philip Yun and I'm CEO of World Affairs. And I'm so very pleased to welcome you to our program with the former commander of all US and allied forces in Afghanistan, General Stanley McChrystal. Um, but before I introduce our moderator for today's conversation, um, I'd like to thank our partners at the Pacific Council on International Policy for their ongoing support and collaboration in our Global Speaker Series. Um, I also want to thank our partners at the Marines Memorial Association. We could not have put today's program together um, without all of your help. So my job is to get out of here as quickly as possible. So let's get started. As you can see, Jen Williams um, is, is not here with us. She is out sick, but we're lucky and delighted to welcome Jack Detch, who has stepped in to take her place. Um, Jack is a Pentagon and national security correspondent at Foreign Policy Magazine, where he writes about defense and cybersecurity. Um, but before Jack went to Washington, he got his start here in the San Francisco Bay Area, where he interned at, among other places, here at World Affairs. Um, and he also interned, he was also at KQED, the NPR station here, where we broadcast our show. So Jack, it is great um, to have met you and to welcome you back. Um, I'm kind of curious, when, when did you intern here? It was 2011, Philip, so oh, a much wow. different world that we were facing. Very much different world. Okay, well, thanks. It, it was great to, to have the chance to meet you. Look forward to seeing you um, in, in other circumstances and in other programs, but I will turn it over to you. Wonderful. Thank you, Philip. It's, it's great to be here back at World Affairs, and I will do my best to, to fill Jen's shoes, Jen's very capable shoes. Uh, but first, I'd like to introduce General Stanley A. McChrystal, our guest. He's a retired four-star general, and as Philip mentioned, served as commander of U.S. and NATO forces in Afghanistan from 2009 to 2010. But along his military career as well, he made stops at the Joint Staff, uh, where he served as director, uh, and at JS JSOC, which is the U.S. military's elite counterterrorism strike force. Uh, now he's a director at Ye or a lecturer rather at Yale, and he's a leadership consultant who's out with a new book uh, entitled Risk: A User's Guide, which we'll talk a little bit about today. Uh, and before I welcome General McChrystal, uh, I just wanted to say that if you have questions throughout the program, just use our Q&A feature on Zoom and we'll try and get you. And uh, that mic in my face means we're recording for the radio. General McChrystal, it's great to have you. Welcome to World Affairs. Thanks for having me, Jack. General, we were talking a little bit of, in the pre-show about how the situation in Afghanistan unraveled. And I wanted to start out with a very simple question. How did we get it so wrong? Just in our assessments, uh, there were reports out there that the intelligence community has had assessed that the Afghan government had six months or so to go, uh, and President Biden himself seemed assured that Ghani wouldn't fall. So why do you think our projections were so off, and why didn't we take the risk more seriously? Jack, please call me Stan. So uh, before that, I wasn't in the room for those assessments. So you start off with an assumption that we got it completely wrong. I'm not 100% sure what the intelligence community actually said. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't hang that, uh, that blame on them for getting it wrong. What I'd say is if we think about the situation in Afghanistan over the 20 years, it was really a case of confidence the entire time. It was the confidence of the Afghan people in their government, in their military, in their own capability to form a nation that was strong enough to withstand Taliban and other challenges. I think it suffered a number of hits to its confidence over the years. Really in the, the second decade of the American involvement, we'll call it from 2010 on, or 2011, there were a number of times when the United States signaled that we are gonna leave as soon as we can. And so there was this drumbeat of as soon as the getting's good, we will. And I think that began really to undercut Afghan confidence in the American commitment, but also in their own ability. And then it was matched by shortcomings in their government and other things. And the Taliban did a pretty good job of creating this air of, a, of inevitability that they would come back. Then fast forward to the Doha Accords 
When President Trump's administration agreed that all American military forces would leave by 1 May 2021, it was a big deal for Americans to end the forever war. It was a bigger deal for Afghans because even though they'd had almost 20 years of assistance, there was a question of confidence. Were they ready? Were they able, capable enough to stand by themselves? And then, of course, with the uh, arrival of President Biden's administration, President Biden is on the horns of a dilemma. He's got to either continue on with President Trump's agreement or abrogate that agreement, which would be really counter to what President Biden had been saying as was his position a long time that we needed to get out of Afghanistan. So it reinforced for the Afghan people the fact that the Americans were leaving. You know, almost like a, a child whose parents have split up and one child comes back, there's this constant sense of insecurity that that parent is going to leave again. And so I think the Afghan people went through a sort of a slow building um, situation that undercut their sense they could do it. And then the Afghans, I'm sorry, that the Taliban ran a masterful information warfare campaign out in the provinces and the district capitals and whatnot, convincing everybody that as soon as this started to go, it would collapse. And so then you get to the actual moment when they begin to withdraw American forces. And many people talk about the hinterlands out hundreds of miles from Kabul. They are faced with the Taliban. The Taliban says, you can defend here and we are strong enough in this area to kill you. And you can die in defense of your country, but the country's gonna fall anyway. So use your head. And I think there was a lot of accommodation. And once momentum begins on something like that, you see a collapse. So I don't think people who are very familiar with Afghanistan were shocked that it could go so quickly. I think it went quicker than most of us thought it would, but I think many people thought it was going to go relatively swiftly once the Afghan people were convinced that it was inevitable. One thing I'm curious about, Stan, is um, you know just just looking back the decision to leave. Um, if the shoe was on the other foot and and the U.S. had not decided to leave. What, what would a continued U.S. military presence look like down from the, the 2,500 troops that were still in Kabul? Um, you know, would you have favored keeping those troops in there? What would that presence have looked like? Um, would it be sort of a, a Korea, Japan, Germany type of situation where troops would, would stay in perpetuity? I'm curious how that, how the, the, um, that might have looked. Well, Jack, that's what makes it so hard. Can you imagine you've got a president faced with a decision that if they pull all forces out, and if foreign terrorists, ISIS and Al Qaeda establish sanctuary again, whoever is the president when that decision is finally made is gonna be tagged with responsibility for giving up Afghanistan to become a terrorist safe haven. On the other hand, if that president decides to stay, the forever war tag gets put on him. We've got forces there forever and we can't end it, it's hopeless. And there's all the narratives from people on different parts of the political spectrum that wanna do that. So it is a really difficult decision. I think that if I had been asked, I would have left a small force of several thousand people. We'll call it 4,000 people. There is a number below which you can't do anything because you can't secure yourself, you can't conduct operations, but there's some number and, and I'm gonna call it 4,000, that may not be correct, where you can still be a presence to help train, you can help coordinate things like air support, logistics, and other things, but you're also a very visible symbol of a committed partnership over time. And my sense is a very visible symbol like that would have done an awful lot to give the Afghan government and military a sense of security. No guarantee it would have worked. But, but that's what I would have recommended. But having said that, the president was with, faced with a really difficult decision at that point. And I think that you are gonna be damned if you do, damned if you don't. Well, that's, that's one thing I'm curious about actually too, is just how um, you know Afghanistan after 20 years, there were different biases. You mentioned the forever war, you mentioned people who wanted to stay. And one criticism that you make throughout the book uh, is about the Bush administration's Iraq strategy, that it was riddled with similar biases regarding capabilities, regarding personal vendettas, uh, you name it. Um, I'm curious, you know, what biases you kind of saw at play when, when you took the reins of the U.S. military mission in Afghanistan back in 2009 and how they impacted the mission and, and your conduct there. Sure. As, as we outline our outlaw line in our book, Risk, a User's Guide, 
we talk about bias and we tend, if you use the word bias to me in just normal conversation, typically I think you're saying I'm a racist or something. And that if I've got biases, I'm a bad person. The reality is we all have biases and we just need to understand that is the lens through which we see things. And those biases reflect our experience, our upbringing, all the different things that go into us. So the most important thing you can do for biases is one, recognize and admit them. And second is use diversity, different perspectives to get into the conversation so that you can close as many of your blind spots as possible. I think in the case of Afghanistan, you have several biases at play. There's one bias on people who look and they say it's the graveyard of empires. No foreign force has ever lasted a long time in Afghanistan. Therefore, anyone who's not Afghan that comes to Afghanistan has a bad ending. And that's that's really, it's a historical based opinion, but I would also argue it starts to be a bias because we start to see every instance through the same lens. Then there are other people who were biased that say, okay, we can do this sort of a, a get it done. I would say when I, I first went to Afghanistan in 2002 and I was there as uh, the chief of staff of Joint Task Force 180, which was the senior military headquarters. Then I came back and I was there with counter-terrorist forces off and on for the next five years. And then I took command in 2009. When I came in in 2009, the biases that I detected were several. First was there was a sense that this is just too hard. And the multinational forces that were the coalition to a great degree were, were looking at it and saying, it's probably just not doable. There's inevitability that it will fail. I think the Afghan people at that point were starting to be convinced that war wouldn't work, that, that they'd been at war 20 years before the Americans and the other Western nations came, and that then they'd seen uh, efforts to defeat the Taliban after that. And they hadn't seen the kind of improvements they wanted or they hoped for. So they were becoming biased that that, that uh, effort was unlikely to succeed. And then there's the natural bias of people like military. If you give a military leader or an organization a task, they're going to try to get it done. And if you give them a task, they are going to try to convince themselves that they can do it, because as soon as you convince yourself you can't do it, it's self-fulfilling. So there's, a, there's an understanding that different people in different organizations come with sort of built-in biases. And so I think all of those went together. And then, of course, when you talk about a multinational effort helping a place like Afghanistan. You have all the cultures of the different nations, cultures of the different organizations, personalities of the people, and you have the challenge of a Tower of Babel that you're trying to mold into a single unified effort. Well, how can you actually get better at, at dealing with that, that problem? I mean, it sounds like sort of a, a Sisyphean task, if you would. Is that is that something you can deal with through exercising and red teaming, those types of things that you talk about in the book? Or if you're you're dealing with so many perspectives and so many biases uh, in a mission as complicated as Afghanistan. Is there really any way to solve that type of problem? Well, it's a great question, Jack, because the alternative is just we don't do anything like that, in which case you say it's too hard. Napoleon was once asked which enemy of all the enemies he'd ever fight he'd most like to fight again. And he said a coalition. And you can see why, because there are inherent challenges in getting a coalition to be effective. Look at what Dwight David Eisenhower did just trying to move across Europe. And at that point, Western Europe, the Allied forces had overwhelming superiority of munitions, uh, forces and whatnot. And yet still, it was a pretty contentious effort that only looks easy, you know, with the distance of time. So I think what you've got to start with is deciding if you're going to do it. You've got to get people, and then you've got to align on a strategy to, to execute that. I don't think we do that very well. I don't think we do that in businesses very well. I don't think we do that in other organizations very well. I think don't think we do that in multinational efforts. We may pretend that we have, and we may even think we have, or we set a general objective, but below that, all the players define it differently, so they're not truly aligned on what they're trying to do. So even if they're working hard and they're good people with good intentions, they're not pulling in the same direction. And I would argue that that happened over and over in Afghanistan. And it was made harder by the fact that we rotated people there a lot. Very few Westerners learned the language. We didn't establish the uh, relationships. And many Afghans, to be honest, were took a transactional view of it. 
they said that I'm going to try to, to get something out of this while I can. And sometimes that was corruption. Sometimes that was on the edge of corruption. But they were very much trying to grab what they could because they didn't think it was lasting. And so whenever you've got all those dynamics, it's hard to get a good long-term outcome. One thing that um, we, we had the conversation about bias and another major theme in, in the book is, is narrative, both um, you know how organizations look at themselves and how they're seen publicly. And, and certainly that was something you had to think about a lot as, as US commander in Afghanistan, as well as on your other stops. Um, one thing I, I wanted to ask you, uh, I know you had a, a conversation of course in, in 2010 with uh, the now deceased Rolling Stone journalist, Michael Hastings, uh, which changed your career quite a bit. And I'm curious, you know, what, what your thinking was going into that conversation about how to shape the U.S. narrative around the war and what you might have done differently. Well, the conversation with Michael Hastings was, while it was a big deal to me, was sort of irrele irrelevant to the larger effort to shape a narrative. But I will describe the, the shaping of a narrative. Um, Michael Hastings came in with his own narrative decided. And so he then wrote a story based upon the narrative he walked in with. And, and media often do that. But what we had to do in 2009 was we had to address the reality that many people had decided that the effort was not worth it and it was impossible. And so we had to convince a number of different constituencies, the United States domestic constituency, government and uh, population, the European and other members of ISAF constituencies, we had to convince the Afghan people that we could do it and we would stick with them long enough to get that done. And then we had to convince the Pakistanis that we could do it because they were hedging their bets, trying to figure out which way it was going to go. And of course, finally, you got to convince the Taliban. And so you're trying to convince each of them that this effort is credible, it is well conducted, and it is consistent. It is going to follow through on what it does. Now, that narrative is good as long as you then behave in accordance with that. So as everybody does the things necessary to reinforce that, then the narrative gets strong. It's in an organization when you have a narrative, as we outlined in the book, Google came up with don't be evil. And that's a great narrative. But when they started doing work with the Department of Defense, there were people inside Google that felt it was in contradiction to the stated narrative, to the values of the organization. And so once you do that, you're, you get caught in a say-do gap between what your narrative is and what the reality is. Then you start to build cynicism and you undercut the credibility of what you're trying to communicate. So, so narrative is incredibly important, but it has to be consistent and has to be followed through. Well, it's, it's good that you brought that up, Stan, because I, I wanted to actually bring up the example of Project Maven, which you bring in, in, into your book. And for listeners who are, that might not be aware, that was uh, the tech company's effort to deploy its algorithm to help Pentagon drone operators through sorting video imagery. Um, one, one thing, of course, that, that has changed the narrative around the US military over time has been the issue of, of torture. Uh, and I'm curious if, if the US military is sort of supposed to have the narrative of being the good guys, and, and that's the key part of the narrative. How did torture impact that? Um, and how did it sort of become acceptable in, in some parts of the Pentagon and the intelligence? Yeah, I don't think it ever became very acceptable in parts of the Pentagon. As you know, that the Pentagon and the military was never involved in uh, waterboarding or any of those things. So I think listeners need to understand that. However, I will tell you that uh, whenever an army gets involved in tough combat, look at the French in Indochina, look at previous wars, there is a seductive pull to taking the gloves off and doing whatever it is you have to do to win that war. After 9-11, many of the people will remember that there was that same sense. We got sucker punched on 9-11, and there was this idea that we're against a new kind of enemy in a new kind of war, and therefore the rules would be different. We, we started taking detainees, and those detainees were not treated as prisoners of war. They were treated as detainees. They were taken to Guantanamo Bay. There were things that we did differently because we classified the war on terror. I'm going to use that term, the war on terror as a different thing than traditional wars that we fought. And so once you start to change those rules, and of course, the enemy does an awful lot to change it because the way that they, they uh, conduct themselves can reinforce that. Uh, then suddenly 
you have this temptation for people to start saying, well, if the enemy is torturing and killing and doing car bombings and, and all these things, isn't it okay if we do whatever it is we need to, to extract the information? In my class at Yale, where I am right now, I do an event often where I talk to the young Yale students and I always put a pretty simplistic scenario together. And I said, okay, are you for torture? And everybody goes, no. I said, okay, your family lives in Boston and we capture a terrorist and we know that he, he has absolute information on a weapon of mass destruction in Boston. And that is going to go off in X amount of time. And you've got this terrorist. Would you torture that terrorist if you felt there was a high likelihood that you could extract from them the information to stop that weapon of mass destruction? Would you do that? And it's interesting how people respond to that. And the thing is, I think we respond to that one way when we're in a warm, dry, secure place and it's just a scenario, a theoretical scenario. And yet if we're in that position and it was your family, Jack, then I would ask, what would you do? Would you be willing to waterboard? Would you be willing to, to kill, you know, whatever? We could take it to, to whatever. We like to believe we wouldn't, but the reality is we're human. The key is our, our organizations and our systems have to be based on discipline. They have to be based on a rule of law and a discipline because over time, what organizations find in the near term, the end justifying the means is corrosive to your own organization. As soon as your own organization starts rationalizing that it's okay to do those things, then suddenly you become different. The organization becomes different, the individuals become different. And over time, you become on the side maybe that shouldn't win, even if you can win. But it is a much more difficult vexing challenge than it seems from afar. And that's why people who've been involved tend to say we've got to draw a bright line against torture. Because as soon as you get close to it, you start to rationalize, it can get gray and it can get easy. Well, Stan, one thing I wanted to talk about, you know, kind of in that frame, but shifting to a different part of the globe is, is risk aversion. And as sort of you describe in the book, the U.S. military being a very risk averse entity, just by and large. Um, given that we're dealing now with, with adversaries like Russia and China that seem to take more extreme risks in ramping up the pressure, whether it's in Ukraine or, or the air incursions that we're now seeing in Taiwan, how does the U.S. kind of find that sweet spot uh, between showing potential adversaries they mean business and managing the loss of life, as well as respecting human rights, especially as we're turning away from wars in Afghanistan, the war on terror that, that you mentioned, and towards a more deterrent type of approach? Yeah, it's interesting. You know, individuals have a relationship with risk, as I describe it, and so do organizations. When I describe the U.S. military as being risk averse, people look at me and they go, wow, they're not cowards. They, they fight. I said, that's not what we're talking about. The U.S. military leadership believes it has a sacred responsibility to defend the nation, and they do not want to let the nation down. So if they think they need six aircraft carriers and 100 bombers, they want to buy 12 and 200 because they don't want to have uh, much chance, much left to chance that they could potentially fail the nation because the costs are so are great. And then military leaders are responsible for the people who work for them. So they have this very visceral sense that they have got to do everything they can to protect their people. So military units and leaders tend to become very risk averse to getting involved in the kind of operations they want to do. I mean, we by nature want to put belt and suspenders and a second belt and second suspenders to do things. Now, you run that against some of the people we see around the world, as you mentioned, adversaries, but I would highlight the Israelis. Every once in a while, we see the Israelis do a commander strike or a Mossad action. And from the sideline, having been from that business, I can't help but being sort of with grudging admiration. Wow, that was really gutsy. Now, I'm not sure it was what I'd do, but it was really bold that they did that. And so this is where we hit that point. I think that there is a need for that sort of institutional caution that you don't rush out into war, you don't rush into maybe ill thought out uh, endeavors. But at the same time, there are times when I think our individuals and our institutions become so risk averse. And in some cases, it's based on individuals 
who don't want to accept the personal responsibility for making a difficult decision that could go wrong. And so they find reasons to dodge it or they find reasons to, to delay it. And we don't take some of the actions we should. The key thing is, I think you have to have systems that, and, and when I say systems, process is really what I mean, that bring in decisions with options you've got, get varied opinions on it, different perspectives, the diversity point, and flesh those out very carefully, because that's the only way I think you prevent yourself from doing the things that are Ill, are poorly planned and poorly executed. And then those things where we're so cautious that we don't act. And I bring up, you know, in the late 1990s, we had shots at Osama bin Laden. We had multiple opportunities to kill Osama bin Laden, and we made the decision not to. Now, in the moment, there's probably a rational reason for each case. But if we look at the sweep of things, we probably regret that. One thing I, I wanted to talk about, just moving back to Afghanistan for a second, uh, and talking about a theme of your book, is the idea of the need to find ground truth to mitigate risk, to find really the most fundamental understanding of feelings and, and situations. I'm curious how you view, just given that framework, uh, the Biden administration's pledge to continue airstrikes in Afghanistan through an over-the-horizon type of approach, uh, and if, if our listeners aren't familiar, sort of doing it without boots on the ground and not persistent air coverage. Uh, is that something you can do, or do you, do you run the risk of not only civilian casualties, but sort of some of these terror groups that uh, you, know, you even fought metastasizing and coming back? Yeah, I think you can do it because we prove it in Afghanistan and some other areas that if we are patient and we collect over time, we can get pretty good positive ID on certain individuals. And then we can do relatively, there's no such thing as a surgical strike, but we can do strikes with things like predators and hellfires that can limit collateral damage. Now, having said that, there's a limit to how much you can do with that. Because what you see is still often two-dimensional. You're watching either full motion video with surveillance or using signals intelligence. You never know the kind of granularity that you would if you were on the ground and you were listening to people, you were at agents or your own forces dealing there. So it is one tool, but, but I would caution, it is limited. There are just things you cannot do with it. Look at the Israelis trying to, to do that over Gaza and Hamas and others have learned to put up tarps and things so that you know things like unmanned aerial vehicle or drones can't see movement on the ground. There's just a whole bunch of things they can do. And then the other thing that I, I would caution is when you are doing operations from afar, they seem neat and clean. And so that can lower the threshold to make the decision to do the operation. And yet, if you are on the ground where a hellfire or similar weapon strikes, it doesn't feel neat and clean. It feels like war. And so we in the United States have got to remember that if we're going to reach in anywhere and do one of these strikes, which to us feels surgical and, and carries no risk to personnel loss because it's all unmanned, we've got to understand that for everything we do there, there's a, uh, a counter reaction. What we saw in Pakistan was we, we did some very good operations against Al Qaeda in Pakistan, effective ones, and, and suppressed them to a great degree. But we also built up a lot of antibodies against the United States. And some of the greatest resentment came in parts of Pakistan where these strikes were hundreds of miles away. But it was the idea that their sovereignty was being invaded, violated by a foreign power and shoot. Think how we'd feel if Mexico flew over the Texas border and shot people inside Texas, even if they were Mexican nationals uh, who were criminals, we still would probably not respond well. So I think we've got to remember that that perspective is, is pretty important. Just a reminder to, to folks watching and, and listening to the program that um, we do have a, a Q&A function in Zoom. So uh, go in and ask some questions. We have a few uh, for uh, Stan McChrystal in there right now, but uh, feel free to, to join in and chime into the conversation. We'll be getting to your questions in a sec. Uh, one thing I was curious about after, you know, you met, we talked about the over the horizon strikes, but it just seems like the paradigm has really changed a lot with the, with the ascent of China, with, with Russia continuing to be a competitor. 
and just the U.S. fighting in, in places uh, where we don't necessarily have the information and communications advantage that uh, the Pentagon has enjoyed for years and years. Uh, how do you assess the risk of, of going to those places and engaging in those operations, such, such as the ones we talked about, uh, Taiwan and Ukraine earlier? Well, it's probably more of a playback to the Cold War era than it is what we've seen the last couple of decades, because really from about 1950 or 60 on, certain superpowers had a monopoly on uh, technology like precision strike weapons, like surveillance capabilities, even air power. And so as a consequence, uh, the United States exercised it most familiarly to us, but the Soviet Union had it and a few others did. Now the democratization of technology means, as you know from your time in Iraq, ISIS was able to use drones with explosive devices and fly them into rooms. A small commercially bought drone with a small hand grenade equivalent, you can fly it into a room where your opponent is and, and cause great damage. That's a precision strike weapon. And so the ability for people to buy night vision, to use cyber attacks, doesn't have to, is no longer limited to superpowers. And so what we've done is we've created a much more dangerous environment overall. And then in certain areas, like against China, where they have put a tremendous effort of building up their military capability with uh, hypersonic weapons, things like that, they are attempting to be a peer competitor, which limits many of the uh, the options we had before. We used to put the American fleet off the coast of China and just that signal would say, hands off Taiwan and we can punish mainland China if there is a, a war. And that's getting harder and harder. I'm not saying it's impossible by any means, but it's harder and harder. Even countries like North Korea with significant conventional artillery and nuclear weapons can send the message that we can destroy them, but the cost to us has gone up significantly. And so that changes the, the dynamic. You know, we went through 70 years where Americans never were bombed from the air. Uh, a number of things we just didn't have to worry about. And now we're in an era when all of that is possible by even mid-tier countries. An era where warfare is even more personal. That's right. I think, in fact, warfare is also going to become heavily leaning toward information warfare. And so everyone in a, degree, in a degree is a target, because if you think of what the Russians did in our elections, they were targeting our minds, they were targeting our attitudes, and they were targeting us. They weren't targeting things, they were targeting us, and they did, to a great degree, a, a pretty effective job at it. Well, that's, that's an interesting segue because you talk a lot in the book about the risk of, of disinformation, both, both state fact and otherwise. And I wanted to ask you sort of, you know, not only what you see uh, in, the, in the state by state thing, but also, you know, we've seen close colleagues of yours, you know, former, your former intelligence chief and the former Trump national security advisor, Michael Flynn, uh, become a purveyor of disinformation on social media. I'm curious what challenges disinformation prevents, presents to American leaders and, and some of the most senior officials making these decisions, perhaps on, on faulty intelligence. Yeah. Jack, I think in the near term, it may be the most uh, dangerous threat we face. And I categorize, I categorize misinformation as unintentionally incorrect information and disinformation as intentionally uh, corrupt information. Either way, it can have a huge effect in misinforming populations who then act based upon that misinformation. The problem is that information technology has gotten ahead of our maturity as populations. We can communicate faster than we can think, and we typically do. We can get out, we can tweet different things on social media, and we can put out things that are completely incorrect. And because it is so inexpensive to do that, you or I or just anybody else has this extraordinary reach. And then, of course, that's amplified by things like bots and other you know, more organized efforts to, to create echo chambers on that. And so we all think that we are too clever to be affected by that. But the reality is we are all being affected by that one way or another. There are parts of our population who are less informed, who have been more affected by that. And we see some pretty extreme people espousing some pretty ill-informed things. 
but all of us are touched by it in some way. And so I think it's a thing that we've got to understand. This is incredibly dangerous. And yet we run into things like our First Amendment rights, which we consider sacred and all. And we've got to figure out, we, we're not going to put the genie back in the bottle, but how we deal with that. And I think there are going to have to be norms put in our society, particularly into our politics, in which people are held to account for deliberate disinformation. If you stand up and yell fire in a crowded theater and there's no fire, then I think you ought to be held to account. And we haven't quite figured out how to do that, but, but I think we need to get there because right now there are a lot, there are way too many people feel that they can do that with impunity. And is that something you saw with, with January 6th? I mean, the, um, the, the protesters going to the Capitol in the, in the Trump inspired riot, inspired by disinformation? Yeah, um, I think I saw that. Now, that's my opinion. And that's one person's opinion. Now, I, I watch certain media, listen to certain things, drew certain conclusions. I think what we ought to be frightened about in that January 6th event is start with the assumption that these are people who consider themselves good Americans, who consider themselves patriots, who consider themselves thoughtful people. And they went to the Capitol believing that this was a good and right thing to do. Now, I disagree with that. I think it was a wrong thing to do and they were basing it on wrong information, but I don't believe that they thought that, which just shows the power of this. Because if you multiply that many times, you can have huge things happen by people who are otherwise good people. Look at Nazi Germany under Adolf Hitler. He was still popular the day he committed suicide in 1945, 12 years after he'd taken over and started wrecking Nazi Germany. And yet he still was relatively popular. So the power of this, you know, we say can't happen here. I disagree. Could happen here and we have to be extraordinarily vigilant about it. Well, taking it back to the 30,000 foot level, you know, what do you see in, in this information climate and also in sort of a great power competition climate with China, the risk of communication that could, could spark conflict or, or lead to a massive war? Well, that's right, because if you think of a scenario where somebody came up with a, an incorrect story, disinformation, and you pumped it out into a population, you could probably whip that population up into a pretty emotional frenzy in a pretty short period of time if it was a, if it was a slightly credible story, even if it was completely wrong. By the time that story could be corrected with corroboration you know, from, from other sources and it could be gotten out to people, you could have huge actions take place. Now, if that happened to leaders, you know, if you get to leaders and you convince them that certain things have happened, and of course, we're in the age of technology where you can falsify films and things like that, you could create a wag the dog scenario where you could get very dangerous action on something that was absolutely untrue. But once you start your action, now reaction is to your action. So it, the war could start for a specious reason, but once the war starts, it's like a forest fire. It burns on the fuel that's there. Well, I have one more question and then we'll turn it over to the listeners to, uh, to see what they have to ask. But one thing I was curious about is, is your book uh, is really about controlling risk at the systemic level. You have some personal examples, but we talk a lot about the systemic. Many people in our audience might not be CEOs or, or four-star generals. So how does a regular person apply the lessons in your book to their everyday life? Yeah, first think about it this way. The greatest risk to us is us. We spend a lot of time worried about threats, muters are coming, something around the corner, et cetera, external things that we really don't predict very well and we can't, we can't avoid. They're gonna come. So stop fixating on them and start controlling what you can control the vulnerability of you and the organization you're a part of. If we think of the human immune system, it fights off what's estimated to be 10,000 microorganisms a day, any one of which could make us sick or kill us. And it detects those, it assesses each one, whether it's dangerous or not, it responds by destroying the ones that are, and then it learns in the process. That's what vaccine does. Our organizations, and even we as individuals, have the equivalent, we have a risk immune system and it's made up of communication, narrative, diversity, bias, action, 10 factors that all work together to determine whether we're resilient. And so it doesn't matter what threat comes, 
our ability to respond is based upon the health of that system. You know, I would argue that COVID-19, which has just absolutely rocked America uh, painfully and tragically, really wasn't as big a threat as we've allowed it to be. It was completely predictable. We had the knowledge, public health experience, what to do, and we got a scientific miracle with vaccines in record time, and we dropped the ball because our internal systems, our risk immune system just wasn't up to the task. Our communications failed, our narrative was off, our leadership stumbled, a number of factors. So that's the way we need to think about it. And what that means is we're not victims. We have control. We have the opportunity to make ourselves incredibly stronger. We just have to take it. Wonderful. Well, um, Stan, but it's been great to get your thoughts. Now I want to turn it over to some of our listeners. And we have several questions here about your opinion on the level of corruption in, in the Afghan government and what impact that really had on, on what we saw transpire on, on August 16th and in the days ahead. Curious if, if you could weigh in on that. Yeah, the level of corruption in Afghanistan across the society is very disappointing. For example, if you went to a district governor, think a county in America, about 366 districts, a county governor made $150 a month when I was there in 2009. That wasn't nearly enough to run his office. If you visited a district governor, like by, by uh, social norms, had to serve you tea and raisins and things like that. And they didn't get any funding for that. So it was built on the idea that they were going to get a certain amount of local corruption. Once you build corruption into the way a system works, then what happens is you get a job from your boss by paying your boss for that job. In response, what that boss does is it's an unholy agreement that they will protect you from prosecution. Then it goes up the chain. So it, it's like this tentacles that go through a system that, that corrupt every part of it. It goes all the way up to the top. And several things happen. One, people don't trust the courts. They don't trust the leaders because they just assume corruption. And the legitimacy of the government starts to be just eroded away. Now, Afghanistan's had this problem for a long time, but to try to get away from it, the uh, both the Karzai and Ghani administrations just couldn't, couldn't get over the hump where they could get rid of enough corruption and build the legitimacy of their government at the same time. And so people just didn't, didn't have enough faith in them. Well, Stan, what, what were your personal relationships like with, with Karzai and some of those other Afghan officials? And, and what, what did you tell them at, at the time about uh, the corruption and, and the tentacles that you saw really expanding through Afghan society on that level? Yeah, it's, it's a tough one. I had some very direct conversations uh, with President Karzai, and he wasn't president then, but with Ashraf Ghani. And, you know, I would explain, you know, I said, hey, you undercut your credibility in your own country, but I, I'm not the expert on Afghanistan. I will tell you, you're undercutting your credibility with the Western community upon whom you rely for, for funding and whatnot. And one time, Hamid Karzai looked at me and he said, Stan, have you seen the black, uh, big suburban kind of vehicles driving around Kabul carrying contractors to and from the Serena Hotel and into the places they were working and they're making good money and they're staying in a, the hotel. And he goes, that's all aid money that is being spent to help Afghanistan. Doesn't that feel like corruption to you? And, you know, to a degree I could take his point because people all, uh, take advantage of a system, particularly where there's a lot of money sloshing through a system, a place like Afghanistan, we came in and poured money. And I won't say we did it irresponsibly with intent, but I think we did it irresponsibly by pouring money in because we wanted to, to do things quickly. And what that did is it created opportunities for clever oper operator kind of people. So, you know, they would be defensive about it. They never denied that there was corruption, but they would be defensive and try to explain to me, well, that's the way things work. And then they would sort of carefully imply, you guys, meaning you, the Western countries, aren't as much better as you pretend you are. One thing I wanted to ask and came from our audience as well is sort of, you, you outline in the book a, uh, a rubric basically to, to assess risk. And 
just curious how you developed that and how you began to incorporate it throughout your career uh, in your assessments of risks and, and major decisions you had to make. Yeah, um, whenever you've got uh, an activity, I think the first thing to do is define the activity, you know, that you're trying, you know, the objective of whatever your mission is. And then as you're looking at risks, I found it best to get varied people in the room and they say, what are the things that could cause us problems here? What could go wrong? And what would be the cost of those things that go wrong? If you get just one or two people from one part of the organization, they're going to have a very limited view because that's the nature of the beast. You, the problem here is you can't get, you, my old boss used to say, don't get treated by chihuahuas. Um, you can list so many risks after a while that you start to be terrified of everything. And so you've got to say, well, what consequences are such that we can survive those consequences? And you can sort of put them in one place. And then those things that we can't survive, you know, if, if they go, we, it's an existential threat to the organization or the mission. And we've either got to mitigate those or we've got to modify the mission. Well, you mentioned diversity and it's, it's interesting because, it, you know, your, your comments on that and your writing comes at a time where we're incredibly divided. I, I don't need to tell any of you that. Um, and we have a question really about what your recommendations would be for dealing with the divisions in our nation and uh, dealing with political disagreements without getting so angry and without seeing events like January 6th, as I mentioned. Yeah. And Jack, and to the listener, that's a great question. I wish I had a clever answer. I've got some thoughts. One thought is small things like start with Congress. I would put some rules in Congress. I would say that Congress members, Senate and the House, have to be to a meeting at noon on Saturday, twice a month in the, in the Capitol. And what that would do is it would stop them from going home every weekend. And so they would be in a place where maybe you could start to get people socializing again, because right now they don't. They arrive Tuesday, typically they go home Thursday night, they, they hang around with their tribe. They talk to the press more than they talk to each other. And I think if you could force them back into an ecosystem where they get to know each other, they interact and they start to do the nation's business with a little less temperature, that could help. Now, understand they're tethered by information technology back to the passions of their district. So it's not as easy as it was 50 or 100 years ago. So I'm not oversimplifying here, but that's one of the things. Another is I would try to enforce norms. There are things that people just shouldn't do and shouldn't say. And if a politician says certain things a certain way or gets out, they can have their opinions on things. But if you get ridiculous behavior, and we've seen some of that, then I think there should be consequences for that. I think, however, we're really going to solve this. We're going to have to go back even earlier than your generation now, Jack. We're going to have to go to young people and we're going to have to create national service. Every young American should do a year of national service, not military, civilian national service, healthcare, education, whatever. I think we should have people do a year of policing in their neighborhood. You know, whatever is right for that person. And they would do it for a year and they'd be paid for it because you, you don't want it limited to upper middle class families whose parents support the person. You want everybody and you want them doing it with people not from their zip code. Because one of the great things we don't have is force mixing. We tend right now to grow up in a certain neighborhood with a certain background, go to certain universities or go into certain jobs. And we tend sort of to stay in, in our tribe just because of the dynamics of society. And I think we need to do things that help break that and change the concept of citizenship into responsibility for every other American. We talked a lot about bias, but we didn't talk about prediction. And, and we have a question on that. Uh, you know, how can how can U.S. institutions and, and also the public better predict the risks uh, to our democratic institutions like like those that we saw on January 6th? Yeah, it's a great one. Um, I think first, artificial intelligence is going to allow us to take information and see patterns like never before. That's essentially what AI is. We, you can be scared of it, but the reality is it's like having a million really smart people crunching and coming out with the, the patterns. And that's going to be helpful because we will see big things. But we also have to admit there is a certain randomness in nature and in things. Like you can predict where I'm likely to have lunch tomorrow based upon my pattern of life for all the years before this. You don't know where I'm going to have lunch because I may not know where I'm going to have lunch. 
The reality is it's impossible to know because there's a certain amount of randomness. So what we've got to do is we've got to use things like AI, but don't become convinced that they can do more than they can do. We've got to assume that there is a certain uh, given play in there. So your prediction is really about probabilities. And I think that can help us. It can and educate us, but it also can help us tell us what is going on. You know, one of the, our biggest problems is we argue about what happened and therefore what is likely to happen. And, and we tend to disagree on what the facts were. And we can gather a lot more data on that. We can educate ourselves so that we can make a much better decision. If we take COVID-19, for example, we can go back now and we can get a really good, it'll take a little while, a really good picture about what happened, what the science really said, what should have been done at each point in it. And we'll have a pretty good roadmap. And then we should educate ourselves that says when all the passions and arguments were going, this was the reality. Now, it won't say exactly what to do next time, but it will give us a much better sense of how to think about it in the moment. Wonderful. And uh, we wanted to turn back uh, with our audience to, to foreign policy for a second. Um, the French have a similar flight to Afghanistan. It's in Africa's Sahel region. And our audience is curious, what, what are the risks of seeing what happened in Afghanistan repeat itself in the Sahel? Yeah. I mean, you from a distance, you see these activities and you say, what in the world are Americans doing in Afghanistan? What are the French doing in the Sahel? Whatever. You know, you go any place and from a distance, it looks illogical to be involved. And you just say, well, get out of there and let local people do their thing. Then you get closer and you say, well, we got into Afghanistan for a reason because of Al Qaeda. And then we stayed because we thought we had a moral obligation to help the Afghan people. The French also have long ties into North Africa through Algeria. And I mean, Algeria was considered part of metropolitan France until the early 1960s. I mean, they, French people thought of it as France. I think the problem is you've got such a sense that you are sometimes moored in that history or that habit. And if the people in the region, if the people in the area just don't accept that anymore, then you are swimming upstream. And the problem is you're gonna have a part of the population who, who absolutely would like to stay with French connections, French there, and another part that's not. But you're very rarely, you see in the last hundred years of history, it's very hard to keep a foreign presence or occupation in a place where it's not acceptable anymore. And I think it's, it's better to get in front of the parade than to fight it. Well, I think we have about time for one more question. And speaking of history and habits, as you just mentioned, uh, it seems like China is now really showing its desire, as we talked about earlier, to, to unify with Taiwan, perhaps militarily. Um, and our audience is curious to get your thoughts about what the biases we as Americans might have towards this conflict. Uh, do we find define it correctly? And, and whether or not it's inevitable? Uh, and have we calculated Xi Jinping and, and China's intentions correctly here? Yeah. Really important question right now. And I would say my take, and I'm humble what I don't know, but the Chinese goal is to make us have that conversation. They want us to question whether Taiwan becoming part of mainland People's Republic of China is inevitable. And then the corollary to that is, if it's inevitable, is it worth the United States effort and a potential war to stop or delay that? And if they can get us to have that conversation, they will I hope that we'll reach a conclusion, well, it is inevitable, and therefore, we shouldn't fight this. We should just let it happen. And the Taiwanese would have to recalculate if the United States stepped away from our current policy of ambiguity, which is kind of implying that we will defend them, and we made it clear that we would not, then the government of Taiwan would have to do an accommodation. And I think that's what Xi Jinping wants. Now, should we do that? Is it really inevitable? I don't know. You, you do have President for Life Xi Jinping, who has started to hang his credibility partly to this, which I think raises the stakes a bit, because he can't back away from this without <clears throat> losing some face over time. And saying, But there's a nationalism in China, too, and there's a, a confidence that didn't exist before. And you say, well, OK, this is that dynamics changed a little bit. But it's been 72 years since 
Chinese nationalists went to Formosa and formed Taiwan. So what's new now? What's new is China's military and economic power is completely different than it was even a decade ago. And so suddenly their ability to raise the stakes and make it so much harder is just in a different category. And so now we, can, we can't say, yeah, it's a tough problem, but you know, push come to shove, we can, we can solve that. Now it's more difficult. There's now a question mark to that. Do I think we could defeat China? I do, absolutely. The question is, they, they will have us uh, asking, is it worth it? So I think we need to consider this as very, very dangerous and likely to be, uh, I mean, there could be a miscalculation. There could be a fight without any intention, but I think that there's likely to be increasing friction over as long as uh, Xi Jinping stays in power. Well, that's a, a fascinating coda, uh, Stan, General McChrystal. We really thank you for sharing your insights. Uh, the book is Risk, A User's Guide. It's out now. So uh, if you want to go and pick it up, uh, go ahead and do it. Uh, really great to be back with you at uh, World Affairs after a decade. And, uh, Philip, I'll, I'll turn it over to you for some closing comments. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Foreign Policy's Jack Detch for stepping in at the last second and leading today's conversation. Um, a heartfelt appreciation to General Stanley McChrystal for sharing his wide ranging insights, pretty amazing. And many thanks to all of you, our audience, for taking the time to be, to be with us. Um, if you enjoyed today's program, please join us on November 16th, 11 a.m. for our next Global Speaker Series program, which is a conversation between Russian expert Fiona Hill and my World Affairs Radio Program co-host, Ray Suarez. It's gonna be a great event, so sign up online on the World Affairs website, that's www.worldaffairs.org. And while you're there, check out World Affairs, the World Affairs podcast, uh, where you can hear us discuss foreign policy issues from all over the world. Um, as a final programming note, you can hear an excerpt of today's interview with General McChrystal and some of foreign policy's new podcast, the Negotiators, which World Affairs will release on November 25th. So with that, thank you again. It uh, looks like we're gonna get you all done and out of here a couple minutes early. Have a, have a great day and a very safe and wonderful weekend. Thank you. <laughs>